Um, <laughs> not that I'm encouraging you to leave. This is Jay McCarthy. All right, thank you so much. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, the next version of your favorite programming language. So we all are curious. Oh, look at that. I mentioned by somebody. <coughs> Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Uh, hold on. <laughs> uh, yeah, don't change your, uh, your slideshow right before you actually implement it, <laughs> before you give it. Um, naturally, uh, every time I do a slide presentation, I need to make a new uh, slideshow system. All right, okay, so we're gonna be talking about uh, Remix. So Remix is the uh, programming language that I'm working on that I hope will be, um, will be what Racket 2 could be. Now for me, uh, Remix is like the fulfillment of a dream that I've had for the last 10 years that I've been using Racket. T about 10 years ago, I had my first commit on Racket. I've been using Racket longer than that, but that was when I had my first commit. And ever since then, I've sort of felt like there could be a language that was not like, that, that, was, that was the most Racket language that there could be. That there are so many ideas that Racket has, but a lot of the time when you're using Racket, there's a whole lot of history inside of it. And Remix is an attempt to fulfill that dream and try to remove some of the history. So when I think about Racket, something that's really, really good about it is it's very evolutionary. There are some big changes that we've had in our past, but those things are always sort of safe to work with. So for instance, we can look in the past, there, we used to have the unit system, and before we had, uh, and then we had modules, and we could slowly adapt the code that used units to use modules, and that was really nice. We had many different versions of the class system, and those different versions of the class system always added more things, but you can still today still use class 100, the very old version of the class system, and they all work together. Um, we made the change to make things immutable all of a sudden, and that introduced a lot of uh, problems for some users, but we were able to adapt it. And another big change that we had was going from the old documentation, which we wrote in LaTeX, um, and compiled it into HTML pages, and we now have Scribble, which is really amazing. Now, what I want to do is want to think about, like, if we didn't have that evolutionary cruft, what would Racket be? And that is what Remix is an attempt to try to think about. It is the most racket. And that's what I want to think about. Like, if you were making a language, how would you make it the most racket? And what I currently think of is Hashling Racket. It's racket, but it's really R5RS plus a lot of really good ideas. That it, I know that you don't like that, but I think that's totally true. And so there are many, many, there are many signs of that when we look at how racket works and how people use racket. So what Remix does is it defines, it, it changes three things about Racket. First is the notation. And when I say notation, most people will probably think syntax, but I sort of think of syntax as being another thing, like the core syntax of the language. And then also some library code things. So what I wanna talk about is these three things, the new notation, the new core syntax, and the new way to think about libraries. So Scheme, which Racket comes from, has very, very small amounts of notation. You have parentheses, quotes, you have like semicolon, sorry, you have, um, you have like the comments, of course. And so like here's a little program. So this is a little uh, scheme program that does optional arguments and whatnot. And even this program is slightly better when you write it in Racket by having the brackets. So it's just slightly different. We have brackets around the con clauses, which make it easier to sort of visually tell apart where things go. And we have the keyword arguments, which are very uh, syntactically heavy to notice where they are. Now, what I want to do, uh, and of course, in Racket we also have braces, but we never really found a use for braces. Like, as far as I can tell, the only thing that people regularly use braces for is like an old version of Shriram's book, where you separate the, like, the, the language that you're interpreting from the implementation of it, and that's really the only use of braces. Of course, they're, they're in the at reader, but that's really separate. Now, we also have found that Racket's really good at making like languages that have just a totally different syntax, like the data log syntax, or uh, in Scribble, which is you know another, we, we change the syntax altogether, and so one of the things that we've learned <laughs> is that syntax can be a good way to like teach people how to read your code and how to think about using it. Um, 
And so what I want to do is I want to change uh, Racket to have some more syntax that's a little bit more meaningful. So Hashling uh, Remix does the following three things. Uh, it always turns on the at reader, uh, which I hope is an obvious good thing for everybody. We've uh, had that reader for a while. The other thing is it makes brackets and braces different than parentheses. So right now, they are abbreviations for parentheses that have to match one another, but these are gonna be just totally different. And then it also introduces a dot notation like we have in object-oriented programming uh, in C and C++ and Java and whatnot. All right, so let's talk about each one of those. So as you all know, the at reader is really amazing. It's really useful for writing docs. It's, un it's really not imaginable that we could write um, you know, the documentation that we have without this. One of the things that's really cool about using it in Remix, though, is that the at reader actually allows us to go into another totally different syntax. So what I have right here is a little Remix program that uses at data log to introduce a totally different syntax for the data log syntax embedded inside of a program. So let me pop out uh, Dr. Racket for a moment. So here we are in uh, Remix where we're using that, and so we have uh, you know, data log right here. But now the really cool thing is that you know, inside of these uh, braces, I mean, it's just a string from the average perspective, but you know, we parse it um, and we expand in such a way that we get the same errors that we would have gotten in hashling data log, but we get it embedded inside of another program. So basically, this is a way to take the idea of composing macros um, and compose different syntaxes within the same thing using this pattern of at as a way to introduce a new syntax for a, a macro that needs its own syntax. So that's an example of one of the things that that reader gives, which is, uh, may not be immediately obvious just saying, let's have the at reader on. All right, let's go back. Uh, I'm not missing arrows there. Uh, because this is a binding, those ones are uses. Yeah, there's many, yeah, there's many uses. Um, okay, let's go back. All right. Now, so the next thing is the brackets and braces. So Remix, what it does is it turns brackets, ABC, into hash percent brackets. And braces gets turned into hash percent braces. Now, hopefully you're nodding your head saying, yes, that is totally obvious. Of course we should do that. Now we can take over what those things mean in the same way that we can take over what hash percent app means. This then gives language authors the ability to put new stuff on top of there, which is very cool. Now, here's a little tiny example of something that is good for that. So here's something that I do a lot in Racket. I have a con statement where I have a whole bunch of clauses, like this first things here, and I keep using first. And what I really want to do is once I know that the list isn't empty, I'd like to define the first to be its own name. Now one thing that I could do is I could write it like this, where I say an else there and then define fl as first l, and this is just so ugly. So what I can do in Remix, however, is I know that brackets are different than braces, so con can require me to always put in the brackets uh, for the clauses, and then anything else is obviously something else, so I just have it as, um, uh, so it just sort of gets spliced in as a begin. So this really works well with a lot of things that we currently have, like defproc and lambda and, um, and the contracts for arrows. There's lots of places where we have grouping and we also have sub-expressions, and currently they get mixed up a lot. And so macros and remix can enforce a difference between grouping and sub-expressions with brackets. So again, this is not like rocket science. It's applying a very racket, a very obvious racket idea and saying, let's make the language that is the most racket. All right, so now the defaults, however, are that, that, block, sorry, that brackets defaults to block. So if you don't bind hash percent, block, hash percent brackets anything, then it's a block construct. And hash percent braces is an infix notation. So let me talk a little bit about the infix notation. There's lots of people that like infix notation for math and because it's a technical challenge to try to create extensible, um, uh, extensible syntaxes, uh, extensible infix macros and things like that. Now, one of the problems I see is that not a, not a lot of these infix notations have really caught on because they're very complicated sometimes or it's hard to remember to use them. And so by having this built in to Remix, hopefully people will always use it and will find good uses for it, but it's quite simple. And so the simple thing that it does, uh, so here's some examples. So um, it uses C's precedence rules, which are obviously the correct precedence rules. Um, 
And the other thing that it does is it generalizes them slightly, which is that any symbol that is not made, that doesn't have letters in it, is automatically an operator, a binary operator. So when you define something like uh, at sign here or arrow, that's automatically a binary operator. And if it's not a binary operator, so, and if it's not one of those, uh, then you can use the quote to sort of turn off the default interpretation. I feel like quote, uh, sorry, uh, 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 co comma, in, uh, in Racket really means whatever the context is right now, don't do that anymore. So I'm generalizing the notion of comma for inside of infix. So you can use comma to <laughs> to, make, <laughs> to make something infix that wasn't infix before, or force something that was going to be an operator to not be an operator. Now the next thing is dot. So we have dot, so again it's hash percent dot. So you have a sequence of things and you get hash percent dot, which is quite nice. Um, and so this allows us to write something like p.bb.ul.x rather than reversing that and thinking about, all right, I want the x part of the upper left of the rectangle of the player's bounding box. This is just sort of an obvious thing that you would want. Now, the dot notation introduces some annoying problems because we actually already have dots in our programs. We already have the old infix notation, we're just gonna drop it. Um, we have rest args, which is really like a hack on the reader. If you really think about why we write rest args that way, we're basically punning on the fact that we're writing an improper list and we're getting it so that when you read, it's like you never put a list there. So again, we're gonna put in hash percent rest. Maybe we can think of something better in the future, but for now it's hash percent rest, a special token inside of lambda args. We can't use um, we can't use the keyword rest because the lambda already lets you have keywords, so it needs to have its own special thing, which is kind of ugly. Dot, 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 that's the problem, because we really use that a lot. So I have three options. So you can use a Unicode dot, a Unicode three dots. You can write dot, 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 uh, or you can do three asterisks, which is a little bit more punchy, um, uh, and I'm not really sure which one is the, gonna be the one that wins, but right now this is what I have. The really annoying thing though is numbers. I would like to be able to write 3.4 and have that mean hash percent 3.4, like maybe we want to call a, um, a function on uh, a number. So because of that, if you want to have a dot inside of your number, you gotta put a uh, hash i in front of it for now. Which, you know, that's pretty ugly. All right, let's switch a little bit and now talk about some core syntax things. So the principle of remix syntax is that every position should be expandable and all macros should provide a way to cooperate with other macros. This is the big thing that in my mind makes Hashling Racket so much like Hashling R5RS plus good ideas, because all of its macros don't obey these two things, the ones that come with the system. The vast majority of them don't, don't do that. So here's an example. So we have def, which is just a simple way to define things, right? So we have def x5, def a function, but we can make something a little bit more interesting, which is that, so def, by default, has blocks everywhere. So you always have a blocking construct. So uh, if there's ever multiple things, then it's just a new definitions, even if you're defining a value. So you'll never need to start off with a let. This is just a little annoying thing. But now really the thing that's cool is that if you put, uh, if you put brackets around the thing that you're defining, then it is a def transformer. So there's this new thing, the def transformer, um, that follows, uh, that, that basically allows that uh, position to take over uh, and, 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 um, and basically expand any other way that it wants. And the thing that's really cool about this is that things, it's not just a macro application because things can simultaneously be def transformers as well as other kinds of transformers. So I'll get to an example of that in a moment. So the other kind of thing that I have on top of def is def star. So def star is like a let star. So it makes it so that the, uh, the things that come after are inside of the definition of the def. So this allows you to do sequences, like reusing a name, for instance, like taking the name, saying def star x is five, def star x is x plus two, et cetera, uh, like you would in a let star. Basically writing a let star without uh, indenting. And we pun on this notion of def, this idea of def star, and we make require star. So require star takes the module that you're requiring and lets it provide a macro that takes over the rest of your uh, file. So this allows macros to, this basically allows modules to provide whole program transformations of their clients. Um, and so this would be a way to implement something like uh, a type system in a library, but it's really important to allow that code to 
um, to take over and see what else is there. All right, so now let's go back to dot. So the default interpretation of dot is that it flattens out all the dots and expects each one of them, uh, sorry, it expects the head, the A, to be what I call a dot transformer. So this is just a, a, a transformer binding that has a protocol for how, uh, for how to expand. So for instance, you type in p dot x, and that turns into hash percent dot px. And then we turn that into posin dash xp, which of course is what the racket code you would write now. But this relies on p already being associated with being a posin, which we get from p having been bound with a def transformer that says I am a posin. So this is mostly useful when we think about how I expand lambda. That's what I'll talk about now. So def uses the same abbreviation of defining a lambda that normal racket does, where when you put those parentheses there, it pulls it out into a lambda. But now what the lambda does is the lambda takes all the arguments that you've provided and it, it uh, grabs the value and then turns what you wrote in the formal position in a def position. So what that means is that the things that you put there can contain def transformers. So for instance, you can write lambda pos and p, and that's gonna turn into a def pos and p of the value that you got inside of the lambda, which now allows that p identifier to carry with it um, all the interpretation that it might have for uh, its use with dot. So this is an extensible way of allowing the dot to not have any particular meaning, but to have that meaning defined by things like structures. All right, and I anticipate that people will wanna make a lot of these, so there's a nice way uh, called a static interface uh, to define when you put in pos in, what are the valid things that can be to the right of the dot. All right, <clears throat> so now let me uh, talk a little bit more about these def and dot transformers. Uh, or sorry, go a little bit, go, go past those to another thing that def does. So this right here is some Haskell code that is really beautiful because in Haskell, you can write, the, you can write a definition of a function across, um, uh, across many siblings in an abstract syntax tree, which is really nice. And in particular, you can write them in many different, like there can, they, you can interleave the definition of two different functions together. This is very similar to the way that we have module plus to implement testing modules and things like that in many different places interleaved with the normal code. So naturally what we want is def plus, a way to write down the definition of a single thing in multiple places. And what def plus does is it cooperates with the expansion context to gather up all the definitions together and then turn that into the single definition of length. Now, this would just be a clever trick if it were just related to match. But in fact, this has its own set of transformers, def plus transformers. And so these def plus transformers, uh, they allow us to do stuff like this, where we can say, I wanna have a def plus for the contract of length, and a def plus for the dock of length, and a def plus for some examples about length and that I want to provide it as well. And so, the, oh, whoops, okay, sorry. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so that's good, um, and, uh, there's an API for that, and um, sorry for taking so long. Uh, <laughs> the one last thing that I wanted to say uh, was that um, for me, it's important that this isn't just a meta language to add some syntax on top of Racket or a library that you can include to get all this stuff. I really want to make a pitch for adding, uh, for trying to create a new standard for what Racket could be and to work together to create that rather than just having a list on our wiki that says we're dreaming about Racket too. Thank you, sorry for taking so long. Well, is this on? Yeah, this is on. Um, I, are, are you really here or is this just a projection of you? <laughs> <laughs> All right, we, I, I feel like I, I ought to allow a, one very short question, although we're also kind of short on time. We can, we can, we, we can, all right, fine, that's fine. Yeah, why don't, yeah, why don't, yeah, we can take the, sorry, say again. Yes, yes we are, okay, great. Um, so, <laughs> what's the, what was the bevel angle like on the, uh, on the I think it was like a 5%. Five? No, a lot.
lot more than 5%. It looked like it was pretty steep there. Yeah, and you're, yeah, exactly. All right, fine. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Jay McCarthy, thank you.